Good morning. Let us please rise for our opening prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Mother, Friend, Beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Ateshwar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, make me happy with awareness of thee. Give me freedom from all worldly desires. And above all, give me thy joy that outlast all happy and sad experiences of life. Om Shanti. Amen. Please be seated. So we'll begin with a period of meditation through the science of yoga, which teaches us to calm the body, and relax the body, and calm and still the mind. And in that stillness, we begin to perceive that perfect reflection of spirit of which we are part. And so you could say that meditation is simply uniting the individual soul, the individual consciousness, which we are, with that vast ocean of cosmic spirit, which we are, but we don't yet perceive that. And through meditation, we begin to have those glimpses of our true nature, that sense of expansion, that sense of tremendous peace and love and calmness within. So that's why we always, here in Self-Realization Fellowship, we always emphasize it's not talking about God. And it's not what you believe about God, but it's what you experience. The only thing that will fulfill your soul is when you have the actual inner experience of God. And when you have that, then you begin to experience him without, in all people, in all creation. You feel connected to that vast ocean of spirit. So let us assume the proper meditation posture. Nice, uh, straight, erect spine, shoulders back, chest out, abdomen comfortably in, chin parallel with the floor. And assuming a nice straight posture, then consciously relax so that it it almost feels like the body is hanging on the rod of the spine, very relaxed, almost like a coat would be hanging on a hanger. No tension, no straining. Lifting the gaze and focusing the gaze gently upward to the point between the eyebrows, which is the seat of the spiritual eye, the center of divine perceptions. And from that center of calmness, First, this morning uh, we'll be practicing an affirmation. And so first we'll practice the affirmation and then we'll go into the silent meditation. And the affirmation we'll be practicing, I'll read it once and then we'll practice it together. I am fearless. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I'm an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. So now, in the meditation posture, 
from that center of calmness and concentration, keeping our gaze gently uplifted and fixed at the spiritual eye, the point between the eyebrows, please repeat with me. I am fearless. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I am an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. I am fearless. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I am an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. I am fearless. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I am an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. I am spirit. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I am an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. I am fearless. I am made of the substance of God. I am a spark of the fire of spirit. I am an atom of the cosmic flame. I am a cell of the vast universal body of the Father. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. Let us now meditate. You might want to just go on mentally repeating that thought, I and my Father are one. And as you do so, really try to feel the truth, the spiritual power behind that affirmation.
In these final moments of our meditation, feel that the peace you experience within is expanding beyond you to include your neighborhood, community, city, country, and feel that powerful wave vibration of peace is expanding still further and encircling, permeating, uplifting the whole world. Peace. Amen. So the topic this morning is a very uh, timely and relevant subject, a spiritual approach to world peace. Quite a few years ago in Self-Realization Fellowship, we were developing a building project for one of our properties, And as part of the process, there was a public hearing conducted by the city, and a number of people attended. And I remember there was one young woman who uh, spoke out in opposition to the project, and she was very angry and very emotional. And because she exceeded her time limit, the city official who was conducting the meeting very gently interrupted her and asked her to please conclude her remarks. And with um, great venom, she told him, well, I'll finish if you stop interrupting me. And in a very nasty way, and everyone kind of just gasped because this was a very good man, very objective and fair, and I think everyone respected him. So people were shocked that um, she would speak to him in that way. Well, he let her continue, and she finished and went to her chair. But I watched her, and I could see in her face she was so upset, so angry, and a realization came to me that her anger, it wasn't about the project, and it wasn't about being interrupted by that man. It was really about the turmoil inside of her. And I had the thought, Someday, she's going to have to look within and attend to that. One of the big delusions in this world is when we're struggling, when we're unhappy, so, when we're unhappy, it's so easy to project it outward. It's my work supervisor or it's the husband, or the wife, or the children. It's like, um, I remember years ago, um, 
I saw this enrollment form for the SRF lessons. And we used to have on there, perhaps we still do, this question, what efforts are you making at self-improvement? And one woman had answered, I'm divorcing my husband. <laughs> Not quite what we were getting at, but... Now, sure, sometimes we do need to take out our action, and no one will deny that. And so we're talking about the subject of world peace, and these conferences for international dialogue, they certainly have a place. Politics has its place. Um, let us not forget Mahatma Gandhi. He was a politician, and he was a very astute one at that. But how did he have such an influence on the world? First and foremost, he started working on himself. And you read some of the uh, principles and ideals he lived by and shared with his followers. Truth non-stealing, self-control, fearlessness, control of the palate, which means self-control in diet, uh, equal respect for all religions, non-violence. Non-violence, it's not always an easy thing to practice, and we're not just talking about non-violence in action, but in thought as well. Gandhi once said, it takes a fairly strenuous course of training to attain a mental state of nonviolence. It is a disciplined life, like the life of a soldier. So the path to inner peace, not an easy path. The path to peace is a war. This is the paradox. To have that inner peace, we have to fight. We have to assert the higher self over the lower self. And that's a struggle at times. There's a story from India of this young, beautiful princess whose favorite possession was this beautiful golden ball. And she loved to throw the ball up and catch it near an old well in the king's forest that was one of her favorite spots. Well, one day she threw the ball and she missed and it fell into the well and it sank down to the bottom. And so she was crying and then she heard this voice asking what the matter was, what the problem was. And she saw there was this big, ugly frog that lived in the well. And so he told her, well, I'll get the ball for you if in return you promise to let me be your companion and to share food from your plate and to sleep in your bed on one of your pillows. And she readily agreed because she wanted that ball very badly, but secretly she was thinking, well, what nonsense is this? Frogs live in the water. They don't belong in the palace. And so the frog dived to the bottom of the well, he retrieved the ball, and as soon as she got it, she took it and ran off and forgot all about her promise to the frog. But the next morning, she's sitting down with the king and queen having breakfast, and there's a loud knock on the door and a voice asking for the king's daughter. And when she opened the door, there was the ugly frog to claim his part of the bargain. And she quickly slammed the door in his face and returned to the table, and the king saw she was shaking and very upset, and when she explained what had happened, the king told her, oh no, what you have promised, you must now perform. You must now fulfill. So against her will, she had to let that frog in and put him by her golden plate, and he had a big appetite, and Everyone could see that she barely touched her food because it was so distasteful to her to share her food with that frog. And then it came time for bedtime, and she didn't want to take him, but again the king told her, oh no, what you have promised, you have to now perform. So she took the frog into her room, and she put him in a corner on the floor and went to her bed, but then the frog asked, to be put 
in her bed on one of her pillows, as the bargain had been. And as she looked at the frog, she could see he looked kind of depressed and worn out, and she felt a tinge of remorse. And she thought to herself, no, father is right. What I have promised, I have to fulfill. And this seems like a good frog. I need to give him a chance. And so with care, with gentleness, she picked the frog up and she put him on a pillow on the bed. And as soon as he touched the pillow, you all know what happened. (laughs) He turned into the handsome prince. When she treated him with kindness, that broke the spell. You know, it's amazing how many variations of this fairy tale theme there are out there. Have you ever wondered about that? There's always the ugly frog, and you kiss the frog, and he turns into the handsome prince. I think... My own opinion is they are all symbolic. When we embrace not the easy path, but the path of dharma, the path of virtue, of righteousness, doing the right thing at the right time because it's the right thing to do, period. When we do that, when we kiss that frog of self-discipline, taking the higher path, then we have the inner prince of happiness, of soul, peace, and happiness. Guruji said, criticize and reform yourself. That is where your greatest problem lies. Affirm divine calmness and peace and send out only thoughts of love and goodwill if you want to live in peace and harmony. And so, world peace, it's such a big lofty subject. The key, reform yourself. Reform yourself. If there's a certain model of car and there's a problem with it, like, I don't know, say the brakes are failing after uh, just a few thousand miles, And so something needs to be done. And so what the company has to do, they go to the factory where the cars are made, and that's where they identify the problem and they change the process so that the problem's fixed. So that's very simple to understand. Well, how is world peace made? Well, first of all, you have to change the way countries Treat one another. But to do that, you have to change the consciousness of the people that live in the countries. And to do that, you have to change the consciousness of the individual. If you change the consciousness of the individual on the mass level, then automatically the global change is made. The production unit, the factory of world peace, it's the individual. Billions and billions of little factories all over the world, and those factories can put out hate, but they can also put out much love, much love and peace. Every one of us is that potential factory of peace. And when that output becomes large enough, then the whole world changes. And the beautiful thing, it's not just numbers. Because even a few individuals who are centered in God, living a life of dharma, of virtue, they become beacons, putting out powerful radiations of peace that have an influence far beyond their numbers. It's like if you take a little sugar cube and you put it in a tall glass of water, the whole glass of water becomes sweet. And so it starts world peace with self-discipline. Before you can have the inner peace, before you can become a factory of peace, first you have to kiss the frog of self-discipline. 
which means doing not what's easy, not what's convenient, but doing what's right. What your heart tells you is the right path to take. Asking yourself when you have a decision to make, what's the higher path for me here? And then using your willpower and discrimination and taking it, taking it. Our reading today from the Bible, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth labors into his harvest. And Paramahansaji comments on this passage, the Lord of the harvest can be attained not by proxy, blind beliefs, nor a sudden unmerited divine visitation of enlightenment, nor by expecting to be in his presence by the virtue of death, but by the spiritual labor of scientific meditation, righteous living, and the Lord's bestowal of divine grace. So that we have to make that constant persevering effort to meditate, to live the righteous life, to take the higher path, and then through the divine grace, that peace comes that gives us such strength, such security in this uncertain world. And in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, He is truly a yogi who on this earth and up to the very time of death is able to master every impulse of desire and wrath. He is a happy man. And Guruji comments on this. Even an advanced yogi may occasionally feel in his active life the impulses of lust and anger owing to karmic impulses of the past if he steadfastly perseveres in his yogic path, resisting up to the end of life the occasional surprise visits of undesirable emotions, he will attain the final union with spirit. So what Christ is saying, what Krishna is saying, what our own guru is saying, discipline leads to victory, and victory leads to soul happiness and peace. Now, for those of you who have families, I just want to cover a few points because being a parent is not such an easy thing. And one question that often comes up, these values I have, spiritual values, how can I best pass them on to my children to prepare them to deal with this um, challenging world? There's a school near the SRF Mother Center in Epic, Mount Washington, about just down the street a couple blocks. And sometimes I'm walking by there when the children get out of school and the parents are arriving to pick them up. And often I'll see this and I'll kind of wonder about it, As soon as the kid sees the parent, they'll just throw their jacket down in their book bag, all their stuff, and they'll run off, and the parent will collect everything after them. And I just think when I see that, well, what kind of lesson is that giving to the child? Sri Dayamata, who was president of Self-Realization Fellowship for so many years until her passing, she often spoke about the importance of teaching your children discipline, giving them discipline. Um, For example, she would say, assign them household chores that are commensurate with their level of capability and hold them accountable for that. In that way, you're teaching them responsibility. And she would also say, don't buy everything for them. On occasion, if they want some, some little nice something, let them save up their allowance. And you're teaching them the value of earning for a goal, saving and practicing uh, self-discipline for a goal. 
in teaching the children, of course, the biggest challenge for any parent is uh, whatever you want in the child, you have to lead the way. You have to be the example. Not always such an easy thing to do. There, there's a, a nice story from the time of Mahatma Gandhi where there was this little um, boy, about six years old, and he loved to eat sweets. And, but he would develop these sores on his body because he was eating so many sweets. And so the doctor told him, you should not eat any sweets until this condition clears up. And so the parents would tell him every day, the doctor said, you must not have any sweets. But there was always sweets on the family table. And the parents and his siblings were always having sweets. And so the result was whenever they weren't looking, he would eat sweets, and he never got over this condition. So the mother took him to see Mahatma Gandhi. And she said to Gandhi, would you please explain to this boy that he's not to eat sweets? We tell him and he won't listen to us. And so what Gandhi said to her, he said, come back in 15 days and I will speak with him. So 15 days later, she brought the boy back and Gandhi took him aside. He talked to him for about one minute. The boy went home and he never touched sweets again. So what did Gandhi do? He, here's what he told him. He said to the boy, for the past 15 days, I've given up eating sweets, and I'm not going to have any until you're allowed to eat them also, and I hope you will join me in this. He led the way, and the boy had such profound respect for that type of uh, example, for that type of love, that he immediately followed. So we talk about world peace. The question is, is our world peaceful? Our lives, are we manifesting peace in how we act, in how we think? Are we, we may not be perfect, but are we striving for that? The greatest way, of course, to peace is meditation. I was speaking with one gentleman who had uh, just started with the SRF lessons, and he was uh, kind of exclaiming with wonder how things have changed. He relates so much better with people. He reacts so much better to adverse circumstances. And I told him, well, you realize that that's connected with your meditations. And he understood. Because when we have little peace or no peace within, the tendency, we become very um, demanding with others. Our frustration, our unhappiness, our anger can leak out. But the beautiful thing, conversely, if we're filling ourselves with peace in meditation, that peace will be also leak out it will begin to express in how we see others, how we treat others, how we respond. Many years ago, before I entered the ashram, I was serving as a lay disciple, uh, as a gardener up in, on the Mount Washington grounds. And so one day, this large diesel truck pulled up on our driveway to make a delivery. Um, we had a large delivery from the nursery, all these potted trees and plants and bags of fertilizer. And when that truck driver got out, he was upset because he had gotten lost. And the streets at Mount Washington, the neighborhood, are very narrow and windy. And if you have a big diesel truck, that's not the place to get lost. So he had spent over an hour trying to find us. And when he started to talk, I never heard such a stream of cuss words. <laughs> and I just froze. I was stunned because, you know, at Mother Center, the monks and nuns don't swear. <laughs> you don't hear those type of things. And so I froze, and I, I didn't know what to do. 
But it was very interesting. The monk who was in charge of us gardeners, very interesting the way he handled it. He didn't scold him. He didn't even correct him. All he did was he said, oh, sir, we're so sorry you've had such a hard time of it. You sit down on this bench and relax. We'll take care of you unloading your truck. And then he told us all, hey, everyone, come on and let's get this truck unloaded in a hurry. This poor gentleman has had a real tough time and he's running late on his schedule. So let's do what we can to keep him going. And so we all pitched in and within 10 minutes we had his load finished and I saw the man's face. He perceptively softened and relaxed. And do you know, from the moment that monk spoke to him, I didn't hear one swear word. He left our grounds with a completely different consciousness. Another story from about that same time. So um, I was thinking about becoming a monk. That's why I was serving as a volunteer. So one night I broke the news to my parents. They were watching TV, and I just said, well, I just want the two of you to know I'm planning to become a monk. And it was kind of surreal. My mother looked at me, and she said, well, if that makes you happy, that's wonderful, dear. This is a nice TV program. Why don't you sit and watch it with us? And so I I thought to myself, well, I guess this is going to be a lot easier than I thought it would be. But the next morning, I'm a gardener on the grounds, and I see my father drive up in his car, And he gets out, and I see the look on his face, and I think, "Uh uh-oh, he's going to make a scene. Because he looked very worried and very upset, like he had come to rescue his son, you know, from the craziness of being a monk. But the monk who was in charge immediately sized up the situation, and he went over to him, and he said, oh, sir, we're so happy you could come see us. Your son is doing a wonderful job. Come on, I'll show you around the grounds. So he took about 30 minutes giving him a tour. 25 years later, when I would visit my father, he would still ask, do you remember that monk who showed me around the grounds that day? He's a wonderful man. How is he doing? 25 years later. When you have the peace inside, there's no limit to how you can influence the world for the better. Really. Guruji said, the one thing that will help to eliminate world suffering more than money, houses, or any other material aid is to meditate and to transmit to others the divine consciousness of God that we feel. A thousand dictators could never destroy what I have within. Every day, radiate God's consciousness to others. So meditation, and that's why we always encourage people enroll for these self-realization fellowship lessons because in the lessons you receive the sacred meditation techniques that our guru brought from India to the West. And when you go within and you experience God and you experience peace as a manifestation of God, then you become a powerful transmitter of peace that really has an uplifting effect on all those around you. You know, this world, it's filled with such turmoil, isn't it? Such uncertainty. We, we do what we can to fix it, and all these outer things to help, they're good. They're, they're very good. But the purpose is not to fix this world until there's no more troubles. There's always has been troubles on this material plane of existence, ever will be. You read the scriptures of India, even in the higher ages, there were wars, there were troubles. The, The idea is not that we find perfection here, but that through the adversities we're driven to find perfection within. 
And the more we find that presence of peace in God and perfection within, then the more we do express it without, and we can make a difference. Can we make the world perfect? No. Not possible. But there's a lot of room for improvement, no? So we have to do our part, and it really comes down to getting closer to God. We do that in meditation, and we do that through a deep personal relationship with God. And how do you develop that personal relationship? Well, I'll put it in simple terms. Okay, so say a young man sees a young lady, and he feels an attraction. So he could ask her out, but even before that, what does he do? He starts talking to her, right? To get to know her, and so that she can get to know him. And then one step leads to another. That's it. So in meditation, in activity, you just start talking with God. Sharing with him, just as you would share your nearest, dearest friend, your closest confidant. And you'll see, he responds. You begin to feel that closeness, that nearness, that dearness of God. One affirmation I'll use from Guruji's uh, teachings, I am thine, thou art mine. I am thine, thou art mine. And you can go through the lessons, the books, choose your own. The, the ones that really speak to your heart. And then practice them. That's how you build that relationship. And you'll see it really gives tremendous security when you do. I'll put it this way. If you've ever um, been on a roller coaster, so you step inside the cart, and then the restraining bar snaps in place that holds you. And you know that no matter how crazy the ride gets, if, even if you're going upside down, that bar is there to hold you in place, isn't it? Now, have you ever gone on a roller coaster ride where there was no restraining bar? Well, I hope not. That'd be a terrible ride. You'd be scared to death, knowing that at any moment you could get thrown off and that would be the end. That's life without God. You understand? Without God, it's a very tumultuous existence. It's very rough. But when you have that deep relationship with God, we still have our troubles. So sometimes we're still on the roller coaster. And sometimes, you know, to be honest, we'll have our ups and downs, and sometimes we're screaming with the rest of them. But even then, with that relationship with God, deep down inside, there's that anchor, there's that security, there's that restraining bar. You know that no matter how wild or difficult life gets, He is with you. He loves you. He protects you. And that gives you an assurance that is more profound and more deep than anything the world can offer. Anything. So, this subject of world peace, the more we seek God, the more we build that relationship with God, we will see that um, we can make a difference, and we will feel it, too. We won't feel as helpless as we think. You see, everything in this creation has, vi is, has a vibration, and we all respond to vibration. And when you live a life that's centered in God, not perfect, but really trying earnestly to ground your life in God, it's like you're becoming, whether you're aware of it or not, a beacon, a beacon of peace, a beacon of calmness, a beacon of spiritual life, light that's radiating outward, and it definitely has an influence on the world. So that's what we have to do. And some words that Master said to Diomad shortly before he left this world, that really is a concise definition of the path we take. He said, Be so drunk with the love of God that you know nothing but God 
and give that love to all. And so in very simple terms, that's how we change the world. To, as best we can, fill ourselves with the peace and love of God. And to live that love in all that we think, all that we say, all that we do. And then you will see, you will not feel as helpless as people, conditions, try to uh, tell you you are. You will know that you can make a difference. So now we'll be practicing our Guru's healing affirmation. So if we could all please rise. So please pray with me. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in us. Thou art in all Thy children. Manifest Thy healing presence in our bodies, minds, and souls. Let us raise our arms and chant Om for healing of the body. Om for the mind. Om for the soul. Om and through the cosmic Om vibration, sending God's peace throughout the world. Om. Let us fold our hands and pray. Heavenly Father, help me to always remember that thou and I are never apart. Thou and I are never apart. Om. Peace. Amen. May God bless us all.